Kids, 60 seconds left before we begin our program. Please take a seat on the main floor. more time. Salaam alaikum. How is everyone doing this afternoon? Yeah, alhamdulillah, right? Now you are all full of energy. I see you've all had some pizza. You've had some chance to browse around the booth. So we're so happy that you're able to make it for our program today. Um, who knows why we're here? Yes. Career fair? Yeah, that's right. We're here for a program about fulfilling your purpose and we have a career fair and an opportunity to learn about what all the grown-ups in our community do. So to begin the program, I would like to call Brother Ali Abbas Khalfan and Brother Kazim Rathati to say a few ayahs from the Quran. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وابتقوا إليه الوسيلة وجاهدوا في سبيله لعلكم تفلحون. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. O you who have faith, be wary of Allah and seek the means of recourse to Him and wage jihad in His way so that you may be felicitous. Salawat. Thank you for that loud salawat. Thank you so much for that beautiful recitation. So before we begin the program, I wanted to give you a quick overview of how exactly everything will go. So just now, I will give you a quick rundown of all of the wonderful volunteers that we have at all of the booths. And then we will hear our keynote address from Brother Hussein Tarara. Some of you heard him yesterday. Today he will be speaking about fulfilling your purpose. And that means how to have a goal and how to go for it and achieve it. And he'll talk all about success um, so that inshallah all of us can do well in whatever field we choose. After that, we will have 
four quick panels. We'll have a panel on health care. We'll have a panel on careers in uh, finance and um, accounting and uh, law. We'll have a panel on business and engineering and a panel on media, education, and technology. So those will be quick panels. I know that you'll have a lot of questions. We will give you a chance to ask a few questions. And then we'll have a chance to browse around the booths just like you were doing before the po program began. So at that time, you can go around and ask all of those follow-up questions. So did all of you get a chance to register at the table in the back? Yes, fantastic. So after the panels will over, are over, you will go back to that same table and you'll get a chance to pick up a careers passport. What that is for all the children is a document that you can take to all of the booths. If you ask them an intelligent question about the profession that they're in, the person at the booth will sign it for you. Once you get 10 signatures on that passport, you can take it to the table in the back and redeem it for a prize. Okay, we also have a contact list for all the individuals who are helping us in all of the different professions. It has their names, it has what field they're in, and it has their email address. So if you have other questions after you leave here today, you'll have a, the ability to follow up with everyone. Okay, so now if you will indulge us, we will just take a moment to introduce all of the volunteers um, that are at the booths today. So I'm going to start from the booths over here. I'll try to run through it very quickly, but I want you all, the reason I'm taking the time to do this right now before Brother Hussein speaks is so that you all have an idea of who we have in our community in all the different professions. So after this is over, we can go and speak to each of them. Okay, so starting right over here on my left hand side is the booth on careers in arts and media. We have Fatima Sugra Somji. She is an avid photographer who made her passion her career. Actively working as an event, wedding, sports, newborn, and portrait photographer, entrepreneurship is in her DNA. Fatima is offering participants at today's program with complimentary headshots, which can be used for your LinkedIn profiles. Please visit her at the Arts and Media booth to take advantage of this offer, which has a $50 value. Beside her, we have Menaz Lata, who is currently pursuing her MBA in HR Management at Pace University and interning with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at NBC Universal. Prior to this, she interned with Executive Search and MSNBC Dayside at NBCU. Menaz also holds an undergrad degree in Journalism and International Studies. Beside that, we have a table for careers in Marketing and Sales. We have Bakar Keshwani, who moved to the U.S. in the summer of 2014 to head Purity U.S., where he developed major clients including HBO, PayPal, Jordan, Pepsi, and Samsung. He now heads Madaro, an experiential marketing agency dedicated to providing creative ideas and the right talent to support clients in a variety of industries. With him is Ali Ladak. Uh, and he currently has a, is a marketing science partner at Facebook, which is a familiar name for many of you. His responsibilities include predictive modeling, brand and conversion lift testing, visualization, data aggregation, and client engagement. Moving on next to them, you can give a little wave to the uh, people at the HR table. We have Alia Jaffer Murji, who currently works as a learning and organizational development specialist at Northwell Health at their corporate university, the Center for Learning and Innovation. She has an honors degree in human resources management as well as a degree in education. Beside her, we have Zamina Ladak, who is a human resources business partner at Macy's, where she focuses on talent strategies, culture, and engagement of her business partner teams. And beside them, we have Samir Mirali, who works in talent acquisition for a large utilities company. In his role, he works to attract, interview, and hire qualified talent. He has interviewed candidates for a variety of roles and also works with students and new graduates to assist with resume writing and interview preparation. He has kindly offered to assist participants of today's program with resume writing and interview preparation, so please do take advantage of his services. Beside them, we have the table for careers in education. There, we have Zara Dalla, who graduated from Malloy College with her bachelor's in biology education, grade 7 to 12, and her master's in special education, grade 7 to 12. She currently teaches high school biology and earth science at a local public high school, and also teaches earth science at the STEP program at Adelphi University. So those of you who are in high school or who want the, the answers to all the tests, go and speak to her. Beside her is Rukhaya Rahim, who has a master's degree in special education, specializing in teaching preschoolers with autism. She currently teaches at the Brookville Center for Children's Services. Then if we move over to the table right in the back there, college table, can you give a little wave? Oh, look how happy they are. 
Um, Mosiah Tassani is heading the table. He has a background in education, psychology, and international relations. He received his undergraduate degree from Adelphi University and then his master's in international education from NYU. He currently serves as the assistant director for the Office of International Students at Columbia University. Also on the table is Muhammad Ali Dirti, who's a first year post bachelor physical therapy student. He attends the University of the Sciences in Philadelphia in their Doctorate of Physical Therapy program and will inshallah graduate in May of 2022. Beside him, we have Nabil Kimji, who currently studies philosophy and creative writing at Stony Brook University. After his undergraduate studies, he hopes to pursue a PhD in philosophy and eventually teach one day, inshallah. Also at the table, we have Sakina Rahim, who is a first-year student in NYIT's dual degree physician assistant program. And we also have Shuhei Balu, who's in his first year at Rutgers majoring in accounting. So a lot of talent over there, a lot of experience um, from students who have just started at uh, college. So those of you who are aspiring in Chala to get to college can go and speak to them and find out what it takes to get in. Moving along, beside them is the table for careers in dentistry. I see a nice big tooth model over there. Some of you might recognize it from your, doc your dentist's office. Um, so we have Zamina Dalla, who is a dental hygienist working at a general dental office. She graduated in May 2018 from Farmingdale State College. We have Shumela Habib, a registered dental hygienist who holds an active license in both Pennsylvania and New York, and she's been practicing in the pediatric field for 11 years. So some of you who might need dental work done can go and visit her. And we also have Patul Rizvi, who is a dentist practicing in Long Island. Beside them is the table for careers in healthcare. Uh, a little bit of a crowded booth. Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of interest in this field um, in our community. So I'll try to run down all of their impressive bios very quickly. We have Dr. Ali Raza Alu, who's a board certified dermatologist and assistant professor of dermatology at the Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. He graduated from Columbia University with a Bachelor of Arts in Neuroscience and Behavior and went on to attend medical school at Harvard Medical School. We have Dr. Abbas Manji, who's a phys physician scientist with a specialty in GI oncology and immunotherapy clinical trials. He holds a Bachelor of Science, a PhD in biochemistry, and an MD, and completed his oncology fellowship at Columbia University. We have Dr. Arif Darsi, who graduated from a residency at Stony Brook University and then completed his fellowship in infectious diseases at North Shore University Hospital. How many of you heard uh, the talk on coronavirus at Masjid yesterday? Yes, so that's why. He specialized in infectious diseases. And he currently practices in private practice out in Long Island. We have Dr. Mustafa Salim Muhammad, who is a pulmonary and critical care attending physician. Thank you for dressing in your scrubs. You listen to me. I really appreciate that. Um, we have Sepide Karmali, who is currently a pediatric resident at New York Medical College, MFCH. Her long-term career goals are hospitalist medicine or critical care. We have Dr. Afshan Muhammad Ali, a licensed clinical psychologist in private practice and in the community. She works with adults on issues relating to depression, anxiety, relationship issues, and identity. She teaches at Adelphi University and also supervises other clinicians. We have Rahila Sachidina, a certified OBGYN and internal medicine nurse practitioner <laughs> yeah, with over 18 years of experience in a New York City-based dynamic high-paced pra private practice. She is also adjunct faculty at the NYU School of Nursing. We have Ali Juad Jivraj, a senior physical therapist at Mount Sinai West Hospital, where he works in inpatient acute rehabilitation. He is also the one who brought all the chocolates for that booth. <laughs> we have Shaheen Makani, who has been a physician assistant for over 20 years, initially working in a family health practice setting, serving the homeless and underserved populations. She has practiced in primary care, pediatrics, women's health, rehab medicine, neurology, pain management, and has currently settled into her GI specialty for the past 14 years. We have Farnaz Leda, who is currently a pharmacy technician and has been working at Walgreens for the last three years. As a technician, she dispenses medication and also assists the pharmacist in other tasks, like completing paperwork and calling doctor's offices. In addition, she is a certified freelance makeup artist, showing that you can make time to pursue all of your passions. Yeah, good job. <laughs> And we have Sajida Kiwala, who is a 2016 graduate of the PharmD program at St. John's University. She started as an intern with Walgreens in 2014 and became a fully licensed pharmacist in 2016. So I, I think a loud salawat for the healthcare table. <laughs> that was very long. <laughs> 
Oh, that was very sad. I guess you guys are not as excited about healthcare as they are. <laughs> What's happening? One more salawat just to show me you're alive. Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Okay, moving on next to them. Look alive, people. Law and politics booth. We have Mathia Jaffer working in policy and legislation. She's a senior staff member of New York State Senator Anna Kaplan's office. And we have Ali Sachidina, who is a vice president, general counsel, and business affairs for Geo Savan, based in New York and Mumbai. A lot of us we're unsure about that. It, maybe he was based mostly in Mumbai. Um, he oversees all of Joe Stalin's legal and regulatory affairs worldwide. He has over 15 years of experience as an entertainment attorney and holds a BA in Religion and Middle East Studies, along with a law degree from the University of Richmond Law School. Uh, moving on, next to them is the table for careers in accounting. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Rosita Jaffer is an audit director in the insurance industry. She holds both her CPA and PMP designations. We have Shamim Ladakh who has worked in public accounting for the past 10 years and is currently a director in the audit practice at PwC, working with large corporate clients across various industries. And we have Ali Hirji who is a tax accountant who advises individuals and businesses on tax planning, compliance and structuring. He has a bachelor's degree in accounting and a master's in taxation. Yes, what? Uh, <laughs> a lot of candy all around. We won't tell you which booths, so go around to all of them and you might get lucky. So next to them is the table for careers in finance. Home stretch here, people. Uh, we have Mohamed Abbas Manekia, who's a financial analyst in the media and advertising industry. He works for Orion Worldwide, which is a media agency. We have Asad Cheval, who works in wealth management at HSBC private banking where he focuses on the financial needs of the high net worth market. We have Muhammad Hassan Alu who is a manager of medical economics. He strives to keep health care costs in check in order to bring quality health care to the people of New York. <laughs> yes, <laughs> another medical connection, love it. Okay, next table, uh, the table for careers in information technology. Tofi Lakani is the owner of a technology consulting company which helps clients manage their IT infrastructure and security. Ali Hasnali is the president of the Jamaat and also has been in the software asset management field for almost 20 years. He started his career at Citigroup where he helped establish a program that allowed Citigroup to manage its software usage through license monitoring. He then established a similar program at Mount Sinai Hospital and currently works as a global head of software asset management at Morgan Stanley, one of the leading financial institutions on Wall Street. And we have Brother Ali Razan Asra, who has almost 30 years of experience in technology. He is the VP of Enterprise Architecture in a leading fintech firm and transforms businesses into technology using the latest platforms. In addition to his day job, he is also an adjunct professor and helps students by mentoring them to achieve their goals. And that's actually a good point. All of the people who have volunteered at the booth have said that they'd be open to mentoring and assisting you in achieving your goals. So even if you're still thinking about which career you want to go in, uh, you can speak to these individuals and they will give you tips on how to get to where you want to go. Next to them is a table for careers in engineering. We have Kazim Pure Muhammad, a control systems engineer. He provides engineering services for heating and air conditioning systems so that they can be controlled online, maximizing occupant comfort while also being energy efficient. Next to him, we have Shamim Rashid Sumar, who is a fire protection engineer with nearly two decades of successful experience in building and fire code consulting. She is currently Vice President Fire Codes and Standards for the National Ready Mix Concrete Association, where she advocates for fire resistant construction and provides technical support at the national, state, and local level. And our last booth over there is for careers in uh, entrepreneurship and nonprofit. Brother Hussein Chirara became an entrepreneur at the age of, can someone guess what age do you think he became an entrepreneur? Yes. Close? Close? A little bit older than that, yeah? Yes? Oh, very close. I'll, I'll give it to you. He, 16, 16. He became an entrepreneur at the age of 16. He sold more Pepsi product than any other store in the community and he has applied, now he has applied his entrepreneurship skills to Allah's projects and he is the co-founder of Wise Academy and Camp Taha and of course as you know we'll be hearing more from him. So apologies it was a little bit long but I hope that you now have an understanding of all the different professions that are represented within our community. Let's have a loud salat for all of the volunteers who are spending their afternoons with us today. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.
So I would now like to introduce Brother Hussein Sharara. He's no stranger to our Jamaat. Um, he came to visit us last year and he's back again. He will be speaking to us um, for a, sh uh, a short keynote address where he'll be talking about fulfilling your goals, achieving your dreams, and achieving your purpose in life. Whether you are young or old, um, this is a great talk for you. And children with balloons, please put the balloons away. We're going to... Okay, yeah, so all of your friends will put them away. Let's put our balloons and our toothbrushes and gloss away. All of that away right now. We're going to focus our attention on Brother Hussein Tarara. A loud salawat for Brother Hussein. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. A'udhu billah min ash-shaytan ar-Rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. May his peace and blessings be on our beloved Prophet and his Amakla Ahl al Bayt. Salawat. I had a PowerPoint presentation, but because of time, I'm just changed uh, my topic because of what's around me. You guys have no idea the opportunity that you have in front of you. I would have wished I would have had guidance between the ages of 16 until I met Hajj Hassanin. But it wasn't until I met him. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and I'm going to tell you how to really take the opportunity of the people in front of you. Because I always have people. I've had teachers come to me that wanted to be hired at Wise Academy. And I'd say, what else do you do? Oh, I sell cake and stuff on Instagram. How many hours do you spend a week on it? They give me limited hours. I say, okay, I'm not going to hire you, even though I'd love to have you as a teacher. But come to me in three weeks, apply these principles. A year later said, man, that's the best thing you did to me is you didn't hire me. Another person in marketing, Facebook, does marketing ads. Again, wanted to be a teacher. I wouldn't hire him. A year later, again. So the point is, people have already done what you want to do. And instead of going 30 years of experience learning the hard way, they've done it. And you could apply those methods and save about 29 years. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself first. So at 16, I did become an entrepreneur. But it actually started earlier than that. What happened to me is I was in second grade and I went to school with pennies to buy milk. And I was the last in line. Because my dad was also a natural entrepreneur. But my dad and my mom were separated and we were left with no money, literally. And we were in the States and I would take pennies. I'd count them every day with my mom, 25 pennies. And I'd wait at the end of the line before I let everybody eat, and then I would be the last one to buy the milk because I didn't want to embarrass. I have to eat my food really quick. And I remember in second grade, I said, there's going to be a day I'm not going to feel like this. I promise. So I had a vision that was greater than myself at second grade. Now I understand the science of what I did. So then I said, okay, I'm going to figure out ways. So I'd constantly look for ideas. How do I get out of this state? So then at 16, I saw this purple interesting dinosaur called Barney. And I said, you know, Michael Jordan was popular. Um, Muhammad Ali was popular. Nothing was more popular than that purple dinosaur. So I came up with an idea. A lot of us have ideas, but we don't know how to take that idea and make it a reality. And the reason is, is because of our own limiting beliefs. As I give you, some of you will come up with an idea and you'll give me a thousand reasons why you shouldn't be able to do it or you can't. My mom won't. What happens if your mom tells you to be a doctor or a lawyer, but you want to be an artist? How do you get your mom to say yes? While continue becoming a doctor, how do you also become an artist where your parents believe in you, but you don't want to disobey them? Because there was one time I was 18 and I wanted to buy a house. I was the youngest 18-year-old to buy a house without a co-signer in Michigan. Because the title company told me. My mom told me, don't do it. I said, Ma, it's a three-family house. I'll make an extra $1,000 a month after I pay the mortgage. I did it anyway. That house that year flooded three times. <laughs> it got demolished three years later. And to sell the house, I took a loss. But it was the best thing that happened to me. So whatever I do for the rest of my life, I better get my mom's blessing. And sometimes she will say, you have my blessing, but I have no idea how you're going to do this but you have my blessing. So I won her over a venture in time, but I never would go against her. That's why anybody here who's doing something behind your parents' back, not only does it hurt them, but it hurts your future self. The other piece of advice, don't compare yourself with any of these people here. They don't want you to. 
They don't want you to compare it with your classmates. They just want you to compare yourself with your future self. You have to ask yourself, if your future self were to come right now, what would they say? What were the things they would tell you to improve? We all know what to do. Most of you here know what to do. But do we do what we know? So I took this purple dinosaur, I took it to Detroit, which was one of the worst, most dangerous places in the country, a place called Grashit and Connor. I didn't know back then. I was 16 years old, skinny, went alone. But I was, I've always been very ambitious. Took this Barney, paid 20 bucks to this gas station, and I said, I wanted to take pictures. So I, I, I found this man. I said, go in the comp store and pay you $10 an hour. Just wave, don't say anything. So now you got this Barney dinosaur, me next to it, Polaroid picture, camera, and people are driving by. So what happens when you think kids saw that purple dinosaur? What would the kids say? Ma, pull over. Parents would come in. So what are you doing? Oh, we're selling pictures. Give Barney a hug. Well, how much are the pictures? Oh, they're one for six, two for ten. Pictures cost me 30 cents. What do you think the kids said? Ma, I want a picture. That first day, I sold 200 pictures. I closed down the gas station. The guy threw me the 20 bucks. I get out of my gas station. I had to go across the street. So that's where it started. And I realized one thing. It was easy. The next thing I started doing, I worked out a deal. I found a person that came while doing pictures. He sells Pepsi products. He says, can I sell them? And I started selling them small. Eventually, I had, what are those um, trucks called, with the, the big trucks? I had two huge trucks filled with Pepsis. And they told me, you sell more Pepsi than any one Kroger, Target. You sell them more than any of them. I had vending machines everywhere. I had vending machines and messages and so on. So I, was make, I actually was making more money then than now. I used to sell like $40,000 worth of fireworks between July 1st and 4th of July. I used to do about thirty to $40,000 in flowers, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day. And I was very ambitious. But the one thing about me, though, every time I would get money, I'd give it, I'd go on vacation. I wasn't fulfilled. It's a weird feeling. Because one thing I've always been fascinated by is success. I'm best friends with an NBA player. He just retired his jersey yesterday. He was number one points per game. I remember he told me a story where he played against Michael Jordan. And he beat him when he was in high school, one-on-one. -on -one. And he looked at me and he said, you know, it was easy. See, becoming wealthy is not an art. It's a science. They will teach you a, the science. Fulfillment, though, is an art. And I didn't know that. Anybody here wants to be successful, you don't go tell them, I want to be your mentor. What can I do to be your mentor? You don't say that. The person closest to the sun shines the brightest. So you've got to say, what work could I do for them, for them to allow me in their world? So that's what I did. I will share the story. So anyways, I was doing things and I wasn't fulfilled. Because you notice, are the people in the wealthiest or people in the nice states in Florida, nice weather, are they happy? Not all of them. If you're a doctor, do you become happy? 60% of doctors don't like their job. You know, 85% of the work communities, 85% of the work communities don't like, don't wake up excited to go to work. So the question I would ask them is, how do I make sure I stay excited with your job? Because the worst, you know what is the worst type of failure? Worst is when your parents tell you to be a doctor or lawyer, because if you're not a doctor or lawyer, you're a failure. You work for the next 20 years to become a doctor. You achieve the goal, and it doesn't give fulfillment. That's the worst type of failure. I, I mentor a lot of people. You know, I have an, a cousin who, sell, who sold his IT company for $500 million. I have another cousin, his first cousin, both of them. One's name is Dave Abdullah. He was number one in real estate. Uh, in Michigan, number one in the country a couple years in a row. He's, he's close to selling a billion dollars worth of real estate. If you look him up, Dave Abdullah. I have another one, Ali Rida. Guinness Book of World Records, Muslim, sold eight cars a day. I have my first cousin, David Turfey. He's a lawyer, became the first Muslim judge within our community. And every time I'd sit with them, how'd you do it? David Turfey said, it would happen 9-11. I went for a judge. Nobody voted for me. They all called. Said, so this is a Muslim, don't vote for him. You know what he did? See, so if you don't have a vision greater than yourself, you're going to look for any opportunity to quit. And the reason why this iPhone, the, this generation, everything is instantly. 
Something you cannot get instantly is job satisfaction. You cannot find love instantly. I can't look, brother, what's your name? Kazim, me and you are best friends. Could I have $10,000? What would Kazim say? Who is this guy? Where'd you get? Send him back to Michigan. Kazim would say, you notice, Kazim, though, we need time to build that friendship. You can't get it instantly. You guys are all looking for things instantly. You cannot get this instantly. It takes time. Meaningful relationships, job satisfaction, take time. If you're looking for instant gratification, you'll never be fulfilled. So what did David Turfey do? He said, I have a vision greater than me. When you become instant gratification, anything that's bigger than you, you're going to quit. You're going to say it's too hard. And guess what? Your parents want you to do something that's certain. That's why they want you to be a doctor, lawyer, because they want to protect you. But if certainty is on the top of your list and you want to do things certain because it's a safe job, I pretty much will tell you the rest of the way your life is going to come out. Certainty cannot be on the top of your list. It can't be. You have to have some uncertainty. Entrepreneurs here, people here, there was some uncertainty. When I went in with, with the Barney, there was uncertainty. There have to have uncertainty. If you don't have uncertainty in your life, you'll never become successful. The Prophet ﷺ, people thought they were so uncertain of him. You're going to get rid of the idols? You're going to stop getting people to kill each other? You're going to stop having them bury children alive? You're going to become the number one name in the world? where every hour his name has been mentioned in the Adhan? No way. you got to pray bold prayers, because Allah says when you do that, He gives you a mental imagery of how it's going to feel. So David Turfey, he did the meditations, he did the dhikr, and he said, how is it going to feel? You put yourself there of when you become a judge. So what did he do to get there? He knocked on every single door in our city. Every single door. He lost 45 pounds. He says, I'm David Turfey. I want to introduce you myself. He won in a landslide because he built that connection. And you know, he's a judge. It's pretty cool to have my first cousin as a judge in our city. I get to speed a little bit. <laughs> so that's what happened to me. I would meet people. I'd say, okay, apply this. I would get into real estate. I got into stocks. I went to school. I used to think school is a waste of time. I said, I'm making more money than my professor. What is he telling me to do? Remember, school, though, is important. I started a school. But high school is a four-year vacation. <laughs> College, the university, is another four-year vacation. They'll tell you. You're good in math. She isn't. You just got to work four hours harder than her, and you're going to get the same grade. Please argue with me. But what is important in school is the life skills and the connection. Schools don't teach you how to learn. They'll teach you what to learn. You go to these people, and they'll teach you how to do it. And that's the key. How are you going to achieve that success and be fulfilled? But first thing you got to ask yourself, why am I doing this? So that's what I did. So then I started going. I went into IT. I got a computer science background. And I, that's what I do, you know, a lot of my work in. And then I still wasn't satisfied. I had money. I had a car. I used to drive a Corvette. Then I bought another car. And I wasn't fulfilled. And one day somebody came to me and said, go listen to this person speak. I said, no, I'm going out with my friends. And I remember I sat. You know, if you're ever sleeping and you hear a knock or some noise, or if somebody comes in your dream, it's real. The Orofa have told us. If a person, if a prophet or an imam or an angel, it's real. <laughs> it's actually is happening. So if you hear a knock, that's actually an angel. I can prove it to you in many eyes of the Quran and so on. So also, I teach a lot. I do a book club. I do a mentor club. A hundred people come every week, and I mentor them, adults. I do a lot of kids' programs, college kids. I'm big into that. But this is how it started. Somebody told me, go and listen to this person speak. I said, no, I'm going out with my friends. I remember I sat, something whispered in my ear, you better go. We all have had those moments. So I shut off my phone, and I made a decision. I went there, and for 20 minutes, I'm arrogant. I got money. I make more people than most people that I meet. I said, let me listen. In 20 minutes, he destroyed what I thought was right, and in the next 20 minutes, he rebuilt it. Because I thought I had life figured out. He talked about how morals can't come from human beings. It has to come from our Creator. Because to me, I would always say, you know, if you guys saw this, somebody stole it, 
And I say, well, who took it? I say, no, this came out of nowhere. I didn't think it was anybody's. The judge says, what? I said, yeah, I thought this was nobody's. It came out of nowhere. You'd call me crazy. But people do that with that whole universe and say it came out of nowhere. There is no need for God. So I said, that doesn't make sense. So I was searching. Then I went into a lecture and I found it in 20 minutes. And it fulfilled me. I said, I want that. So he had a camp. I started emailing him. I started saying, what can I do? First year I went to one of his camps before we bought one. I would clean toilets for one year. I would wash the showers. I would help people with their laundry. I didn't speak at all. The people closest to the sun shine the brightest. I said, Hajj, I want to start youth groups. We started youth groups. He started helping me. So I said, okay. Eight kids started. Then eventually, we, 150 kids. We would teach them Quran, how to recite, how to pray. And then from there, somebody, a parent, came to me and says, start an after-school program. Hajj, Hassanin, what do you think? Let's do it. Another parent, why don't you guys start a school? Let's do it. Buy a camp. Let's do it. To date, we're probably valued of over $40 million worth of projects. Can I tell you something? It was easy because it wasn't us. When you apply a principle, Allah will take care of the rest. But it is 16-hour days. It is seven days a week. So those that are watching Netflix, a brother came to me and said, I want to be a professional soccer player. So what are you doing on your part-time? The NBA players woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning. But the key is to have a vision that's greater than yourself that will fulfill you. So you have to ask yourself, if certainty or gratification is top of our list. Everybody wants to be gratified. Instagram, Twitter, social media. They wake up and take pictures of their feet and they post it. It's happening. I ate this for breakfast and we're waiting to see how many likes. We're looking for, if gratification and certainty is happy list, it's not going to make you happy. It's just not. Love has to be. But it can't be in relationships with other people. It could only be with Allah. When I found that out, that's when the doors open up in my life. So you have to do something that's greater than yourself and say, how will it feel? And learn how to do it. Get their emails. Tell them, I'll come to your house, whatever you need. Read. Readers are leaders. If you don't read or you don't know how to read, you're the same. There's no difference. The point is, there was um, one last point that I wanted to make. Salawat. One more salawat. Whereas I forgot my point. My point is that I've met some of the most successful people, but you want to fulfill me. There's a person named Robin Williams. Robin Williams won an Academy Award for making everybody laugh. He was one of the funniest humans to ever exist. Some of the people here know who he is. Then he said, I wanted, an award. I wanted a family. He got a family. He had kids. Then he said, I wanted an award, Academy Award for a serious role. He got it. He, he, he did a movie called Good Will Hunting. He hung himself. He made everybody laugh. He made everybody happy except who? Himself. See, fulfillment is certainty. Fulfillment is gratification. You want everybody to be pleased with you. You'll never be satisfied. Top of your list needs to be love, and it has to be love for Allah. Where you ask yourself, what can I do that's greater than myself for Allah? And that's what I'm fascinated by. That way when you become a doctor, you become something, and you're not happy with it, it doesn't matter. Because you're going to feed into what you, it does make you happy. Because things may change. But you have to find that inner satisfaction. By the way, you know you can never, you can find wealth, there's a science. But you never may feel wealthy or abundant. You may find love, somebody to love, but you may never love that person because you don't love yourself. There's a person, that's why taking time to yourself, there's a person named Michael Phelps. He won like 20 gold medals. You know what he would do for two hours a day? He would be in the water mentally rehearsing how it's going to feel to win that. I was going to do it with you guys and how to do that. But it's so important to start off your day with success. Do your bed. Forget your phone. Don't touch it. And just don't move until your body's convinced that it's the future that you want to be. Michael Jordan, you guys know him? He had a game-winning shot against Utah Jazz. They asked him, how did it feel? 
said, I felt nothing. He said, why? He says, I've hit that shot over a thousand times. When Mahmoud Abdul Rauf beat Michael Jordan, he said it was easy. But the hard part is the satisfaction. Because society is telling us what to do to make us happy. Then I question, why does 86% people, percent of people dislike their jobs? People look forward to Mondays. I mean, look forward to Fridays, are sad about Mondays. We walk to school, we run home. We don't like going to school. Then we say we want to be successful, but we have the wrong attitude. And there's so many studies that I could show to prove this. So you've got to ask yourself, what is your state? Because if I see somebody, I've met millionaires, they would come to me for advice. And they were always frustrated. So I don't care if you have millions. If your state is frustration, then you're going to have to be frustrated with everything. Ask yourself, what state were you in today? Did you wake up happy? Did you wake up excited? For the older people, the reason why you didn't wake up excited today, because it's the same day as yesterday. And if your yesterday is the same as today, then I can predict your future. And if you don't have something new, and I challenge, I've challenged 70 year olds. We have people in our book club that are 60 years old. Said, I haven't read a book in 50 years. And I feel great, and I'm learning. Because if you don't read, nurses have the best brains, not nurses, nuns. Two things, lifelong learners, so, <laughs> lifelong learners, and they're always in a state of tasbih, dhikr. For the psychiatrists out there, tell them, scan, look at Brandt's games, look at Dr. Daniel Amen. He's the one to prove that marijuana is the second most toxic thing to your brain. People say, drink wine once a day, it's good for you. He says, Are you guys crazy? Look what it does to your brain. Complaining. When you complain, cortisol levels go up, heart attack levels. Because if you truly believe your thoughts have something to do with your future and you have negative thoughts, those negative thoughts make you stress. That stress deregulates genes, and those genes causes cancer and disease. 95 to 99 percent of cancer and disease is not what you were born with. It's just through thought alone and how you react to the environment. It's not just the gene. It's above that. That's why I've helped people through cancer to be able to think greater than they feel and how it's going to feel when the cancer is gone, how it's going to feel when you become a top doctor, how it's going to feel when you become whatever it is you want. And you tie in emotion and intention. That's what David Turfey did. Dave Abdullah, number one in the country. Every day, he would write number one in Michigan. His wife was going to divorce him. says, you maxed out all your credit cards to get training. What are you doing? You became an accountant. What are you doing? He says, I have a vision. Stick with me. And he would work at it. He was said number one in Michigan. When he wrote it, he wasn't even selling a house a month. Eventually, he got there. So you do have to find somebody that believes in you. But find people that have consistent states. If you wake up angry, then you get tired, and then you're happy, and you're not consistent, find somebody in your life that's consistent. Who's your go-to person? When you do fall off, you call them. It could be them. You shoot them an email saying, I'm lacking a little bit. What do you think? What advice? It just takes one. When I did it and I found my person, I would do anything for that person. Hajj Hassanin needed coffee. He needed tea. He needed me to be out in the rain, be on the roof. I didn't care because that gave me fulfillment because I saw him doing Allah's work. Well, the first time I saw him, I went to the camp. He was on the tree, cutting down a tree. And I say, scholars cut trees? It didn't make sense to me. And one of the most dangerous jobs is cutting down trees. He said, if he's willing to do that, that's what I want to follow. I've seen him. We couldn't find a plunger, and the kids' toilets were plugged. He put his hand in there. He just, he, 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 he wasn't full of himself. And I said, that's what I want. How do I get that? And I realized I needed a vision that was greater than myself. So ask yourself, what is that vision that you really want? that you'd wake up in the morning excited. And if it doesn't excite you, change it. I was speaking in New Jersey last year, and somebody asked me a question. If I'm becoming an accountant and I don't like it, what should I do? I said, quit. In your 20s, you better take the most amount of risk. Parents, support them. Even if they fail, that's when you want. Because the 70-year-olds, what do they regret? They didn't take risks. And they worried about things that they couldn't control. You want to take maximum amount of risk, especially if you're an entrepreneur. You've got to learn how to fail in order to succeed. So I said, you should quit. I said, I know 
accountants that go into $200,000 school debt for going to these top schools and they make $70,000 a year. Doesn't make accounting sense. The person next to me came to me after crying. He says, yesterday I was an accountant. And I quit because I wasn't happy. And I'm going to Toronto to be an entrepreneur. And somebody told me to come to this mosque in New Jersey to hear you speak. And I said, God, give me an answer. And he came. And now I'm talking to him. And I said, you're telling this person next to you what to do. And that's what I just did. And I wasn't certain. Now I am. And that's what I do. When people say, when I tell people, hold my hand. We're going to take this river. We're going to take this walk across this river of change. And every time they do the work, they wake up in vicar, they pray on time, they work on the habits. If you don't know what your bad habit is, just go to your parent today and say, what's one thing I need to improve, Ma? Do that thing. Watch how your state changes in one week, two weeks. Because doing the easy things is, is easy. But changing your bad habits is hard. You keep doing it until it becomes easy. For some of you, it's prayer. Prayer is hard. Your parents keep reminding you. Here's the interesting thing. Let's say I walked into your guys, I'll end with this. I'm sorry I took more time. We'll end with this. Let's say I walked into your house, and your house was spotless. Moms, think of this. Your kids, your kids went in and cleaned, your, your son or daughter cleaned the whole house, did laundry, cooked, bought you flowers, vacuumed, cleaned the bathrooms, cleaned the toilets, and your mothers walked in. What would they tell you? Who are you? <laughs> what do you want? Would they be surprised? They would be surprised that's the problem. Now I challenge you in one year, you do those things. And then she walks in with her friend, and her friend says, who cleans your house? Oh, that's my son. What planet is he from? Oh no, it's normal. Right now, it's a surprise for most people to be great. What we do is we compare ourselves with people lower. You have people here that are higher. You've got to say, what did you do? and What could I do to even be better? Because they've made mistakes that you could learn from. But the key is making sure it fulfills you. So certainty, wealth, these things don't fulfill you. I've met people worth millions that are so depressed. Why would somebody who's made the world laugh kill himself? That's why the only true fulfillment is taking things to the end goal, which is Allah, and knowing you're going to return there, and making sure you go there well pleased by doing His work. That's why I gave up everything that I did. Hajj Hassanin gave up a $5 million contract, because if he would have signed it, he would have had to work 70 hours a week. And he asked his mom, what should I do? His mom says, what do you mean? Don't even look at that. What's that going to do for the Akhirah? And he didn't sign it. And ever since then, He's been doing all these projects. I'm the same way because those things don't fulfill me. I've tried it. So it's got to be something that's greater than you. you. Say, what am I going to be known for when I leave this world? What do I want to be known for? Because people are not going to, at your funeral, people are not going to say, oh, you drove a nice car. You drove a nice, they're going to say, how kind were you? Parents, don't make a big deal when your kids get a straight A's. It's easy. Make a big deal when your kids open up the door for somebody. We're not making that a big deal anymore. It's more important that our kids get into Harvard, Stanford. Just so you know, the diploma is being outdated. It's all about mem memorization that's going away. I don't need to know 50 presidents anymore. I could just go on Siri, calculus equation, a Siri. But the connections that you do build in school, the life skills that you do learn are the most pivotal things because it's changing. The diploma now... Amazon, Facebook, um, Apple. If you have the skills, they're saying we don't, need a, we don't need you to have a degree because most of the skills you can learn outside. And now schools are like, wait, why am I charging $200,000 for a degree that's only going to make 60000 People are waking up. It's no, lo no longer enough to know. You have to know how. Whatever profession you're going to be, then I challenge you, buy a book, read it, and then YouTube videos, Whatever it takes. There was a sister who wanted to be a pilot. I said, I gave her the dua. I gave her the special prayer. I convinced her mom. One week later, she emailed the navigation instructor in Eastern Michigan. One week later, she's flying a plane. And her mom's in the back reciting dua.
I'll always get a text because I deal with a lot of people, Brother Hussein, you won't believe what's happened. And it's got to come unexpected because if it's expected, that means you're not doing anything new. So if you keep being the same personality and expecting a different reality, that's impossible. You're going to be waiting until you die. Some of you got a bad grade. You blamed your teacher. Then you're going to blame the college professor. Then when you get married, you're going to blame your wife. Then when you have kids, you're going to blame your kids. It's all a disaster. Well, the whole time you were the disaster. Change your personality, and then you change the reality. And Allah says, just change one thing, because you took one step towards me. Watch how I do. And I tell people, just try it for one week, 40 days, whatever it takes. But go to your parents and say, what's one thing I'm going to change? And then watch how the unexpected happens. Take advantage of these people. You guys have no idea what a blessed opportunity. That not only are they professionals, they're Muslims. People who are God conscious, who are also know where fulfillment is. I've been into Christian, Jewish retreats. I've been into different retreats. Nobody has bullseye like we do. Let's take advantage of it. Most of us here are Muslim by birth. You should challenge yourself and your beliefs to be Muslim by choice. That's why you have scholars here. That's why you have this masjid. It should be a choice, not because of birth. And that's when you strengthen your belief. Because I tell parents, what am I going to do for your son when you do get accepted to Harvard or Michigan State and you see that party on weekends, that you're going to look at it and it's going to be ugly because you know where that's going to take you. Too many of us are being tempted where we go into these top universities and so many Muslims are becoming lost because they never learned how to deal with it. But if you have a vision that's greater than yourself, you'll see that filth. And that's the key to get mentors like that. So let's take advantage of that. So what? Time for one question. Any question at all? Any question? Going once? Any question at all? Yes, brother. Uh, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Uh, he is number one points per game. Kevin Durant is number two. And he had a vision. He would drink. Eat cereal with uh, water. You can never afford milk. His vision was, I'm going to buy my mom a brand new house by becoming an NBA player. He visualized in third grade scoring 30 points per game in college. He visualized and tied an emotion signing autographs in high school and filling up the arena. It all came. But he worked towards that vision every day. You can't just visualize and not work towards it. He worked towards it. And then one day he said, Ma, let's go house shopping. So his mom went in the house. Says, you know, it's a funny thing. The towels in the bathroom have my name on it. They have the same name. It's like, Ma, this is your house. He says that was the proudest moment of his life. Same with me, same with Hajj Hassanin. The reason why we have $30, $40 million worth of success, it's got nothing to do with us. If we get in the way of that, we'd mess it up. It's two things. Making that niyyah for Allah, trying to become better versions of ourselves. I have a long way to go. But two, it's just making sure we respect our mothers and our fathers. I don't do anything. Ma, what do you think? Whenever I have bala happen to me in my life, the first thing I do is say, Ma, pray for me. If anybody here who has a friend, Ma, what do you want? You're bugging me. Leave me alone. Click. Distance yourself. That will take you to the worst existence. Run. Don't walk. Run away. Because if somebody could treat their mother like that, one day they're going to treat you the same way, if not worse. Just be attentive. Pay attention. Be present. And ask yourself your state. Parents, the energy is felt in the house. If you notice you're moody or you're always anxious, and then you're asking your kids how you're anxious, why you're moody. It's because of you. Parents, if you want your kids to have a goal bigger than themselves, but then you don't have a goal where your kids are the center, your kids are never going to get there. You've got to have something that's for Allah that you're giving back to. After you take care of your kids and take care of your husband, take care of the house, what's left? What are you doing with your existence? I challenge all of you. And if you do do that, watch how your kids follow you. Your kids don't listen to what you say. They follow what you do. Don't ever forget that. I've never seen a bad kid, and I've dealt with drug abuse, everything under the sun, homosexuality, everything usually leads to bad parenting. we got really bad parenting going on. That's why I think in this program they're going to do parent workshops, marriage workshops, and so on. Thank you so much. Salawat.
I apologize. If I said anything that it's sometimes I do do that, I do apologize. But I swear the intent is for us to get closer to Allah. So please forgive me. A loud salawat for Brother Hussein, please. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Uh, thank you so much for those wise words. Inshallah, if anyone has follow-up questions after the program, you can go and speak to him at the booth for careers in entrepreneurship. I would like to begin with the first panel, which is for careers in healthcare. As the uh, panelists are making their way up here, children sitting at the front, I would like you to stand up and do five jumping jacks, and then you can sit down again. So those of you who are on the panel for careers in healthcare, please make your way up to the front. You could do another five, yeah. You could do another five. Get all of those uh, things out. Oh, the girls can do it too. Girls can do it too, it's fine. Okay, so as they're getting seated, we will all settle down. Yep, thank you for doing the jumping jacks. Hopefully you got all the wiggles out. Please take a seat and now we will begin with our panel on careers in healthcare. So we are so blessed today to have so many people with interest in health care. So for this first panel, I'll open up with um, asking all of you, can you please state what your current position is? I know I gave a brief intro when you were all at the booth, but state what your current position is and provide a brief summary of how you got here. Thanks very much. Thank you. So like, um, yes, like you were saying, I am a clinical psychologist. Has anybody heard of a clinical psychologist or a therapist? Yeah, yeah, okay. So that's the kind of therapy where you do talk therapy, right? So we sit in a room and we talk. So that's what I do. I went to school for that. Um, so I work in an office. I work in a clinic. I also teach at Adelphi University. Um, and I also supervise other people on the people they do therapy with. And so to get to where I got, I started with four years of college in New Jersey, actually, at Montclair State. And then I did my master's at Columbia University. That took about a year. And then I was in school for another five years to become a doctor. So there are many ways to become a therapist, but if you want to be a PhD in psychology, that's what you would do. Okay? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I know you all had lunch, so I'm going to do it one more time. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Okay. Um, so my name is Sajida. I'm a staff pharmacist at Walgreens in Smithtown. Um, how I got there, I went to pharmacy school for six years. Um, after graduating high school, it was a direct program. If you basically kept up with your grades um, and you met all the requirements, you graduated with the degree. Um, and the last year of the program was um, being on site at different locations in hospitals, community pharmacies, um, compounding pharmacies where you actually make the drugs to get the experience. Um, and that's a requirement in order to get licensed. Um, I started with Walgreens as an intern in 2014. Um, and then the January before I graduated, I was offered a position to become a pharmacist full-time um, after graduation. So that's um, kind of how I landed into the position. Um, for the first year, I floated, meaning I worked at various Walgreens locations across um, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk counties. Um, to kind of, the purpose of that is so that, you know, they throw you to the wolves. You're going to be in a different environment each day, different situations. You're going to meet different people to kind of just improve yourself with what you do. And then um, eventually I was offered a staff position uh, when it opened up. And I've been there for the past year. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Rahila. Um, I am a nurse practitioner um, in both adult and women's health care, but I am sub-specializing in women's health care. The way I got here was I did a bachelor's in nursing science um, in Canada at Ryerson University and then uh, worked as an RN briefly before I applied 
to Columbia uh, for a master's program. So it's a two-year, four-year bachelor's degree and then a two-year master's degree um, in which the master's preparation teaches you with different rotations through um, different subspecialties uh, so you can get um, various experiences and then you do certification exams, um, board exams, and then you can work as a nurse practitioner. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. I'm Abbas Manji. Um, I'm a physician scientist at Columbia University, so I'm an assistant professor of medicine and director of translational uh, medicine uh, for pancreas cancer. Um, I did my undergrad at University of Michigan. Um, I was always interested in research, um, so I did a PhD in biochemistry and virology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Then I did two uh, postdoctoral fellowships, one in genomics, one in proteomics. Uh, then I decided that I wanted to um, do medical uh, translational research. So I did my medical degree, then I went and did residency at Albany Medical, uh, medical School. Then I did my clinical fellowship at Columbia University. Um, and then I stayed on as faculty. So a lot of school. <laughs> Yes, I was going to say, um, based on all of these four individuals, there's a lot of education sitting at this table here. Um, my next question, and all of you don't have to respond. Anyone who'd like to respond can. Uh, what are the key skills that someone in your field should possess? Anyone? So what I might actually suggest might apply to everybody sitting at this table at the same time, because we're in fields and jobs where we're thinking about other people, right? And so we're constantly taking on other people's problems, whether it's medical, whether it's emotional. So I do um, recommend anybody I speak to, if they are interested in mental health in particular, of course, being a good person, being a nice person, having compassion, um, but also being able to take care of yourself, you know, knowing your boundaries, knowing your limits, knowing how to take time for yourself and basically practice what you preach. If you're going to encourage other people to work out or go to their own therapy, that is something that you should consider doing for yourself. Um, I would say other things that I think can come with training, but it is a plus if you have it going in, is critical thinking, especially for what I can say for therapy, is being able to hear what somebody else is saying and apply a new perspective but also flexibility in thinking so that you can help, you can consider their own point of view. That's a good point about the flexibility. I think it applies to many of the fields that uh, we'll be covering today. Um, anyone else? So I think that before you, you know, as the brother uh, pointed out previously, I think you have to ask what you want and not what others want for you. Uh, what is great for somebody else may not be great for you. Um, I recommend don't go for titles. Think about what those titles mean. Um, being a physician or being a lawyer or being an engineer or, or having a title sounds great, but you need to sort of really understand what that title entails. Uh, if you're, you know, if you want to be a physician, um, you need to be on call. You need to be work. You need to be working when you're tired. Uh, which means sacrificing weekends, sacrificing outings, sacrificing nighttime, uh, being ready f to pick up the call at 2 in the morning and, and really being ready to go to the hospital. Uh, you don't see that when you see somebody who has that title, uh, somebody who is an accountant. You know, it sounds all great, but then come tax season, you know, you need to put yourself in that state. So I think that when you're going for a career or when you think about any career, uh, you need to really sort of try and match yourself up to somebody who's doing that career and really going and, and seeing what they truly do. So for me, for a physician, uh, you, you, you have to put everybody else first. You have to put your patients first. Um, your patients are in a position where, you know, they're not always happy to see you. Nobody's happy to see you. They're coming to you not because they want to see you because they're feeling great. Right, especially in my field of oncology, nobody wants to see you. I treat pancreas cancer, um, you know, nobody wants to see me. Uh, they're, they're not happy to see you, they're feeling miserable. So they're not gonna be in the best of mood and you need to have patience. You need to put yourself in their, in, in their space and say, 
you need to be very understanding. That's one thing. Um, the second thing is I match research. Research is pretty much 99% failure. So if you're somebody who wants instant gratification, where I'm going to do an experiment and it's going to work and everything's going to go fine, you need to really think about that career. I'll give you one quick story. Uh, the way that I got into research is that I got a grant and I went to South Africa. I spent a summer in South Africa and I did research. And every experiment worked. And I was like, that's it. I'm going to go do my PhD and I'm going to be a researcher. For eight months in my first year of my PhD, not one experiment worked. Okay? And I called my mentor in South Africa and I said, I need some advice. This, this is not working. And he said, well, to be honest with you, when you were in South Africa, that was a, such a streak of luck. <laughs> the reality is what you're, what you're going through. So for research, you need to be very inquisitive and curious, and the goal is to stick with it. Thank you. And that point about patience, I think, is a life skill. I'm going to open it up to the um, audience and ask if anyone has a question for anyone on our panel here um, for careers in healthcare. Did I see a hand here? You had a question? No? Okay. Does anyone have a question about healthcare? Yes? How does it feel like when you're actually like with a patient and like you're like helping a patient? Like, what do you feel then? I'm going to answer that because um, one of the first experiences I had um, when I saw my first patient who was, I deal with women's health care, so I deal with um, pregnancy and growth of babies. Um, when I heard the baby's heart rate as a new graduate, and the parents also heard the baby's heart rate, and the emotion that came from that, the sheer amount of happiness that came from that was really rewarding. Um, and it also brought me back to thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the miracle that growth of life from one to another is. Amazing, yeah. Any other questions for our individuals who are in healthcare? Yeah. What was one of the um, hardest patients that you've had? <laughs> so basically the opposite of the <laughs> previous <laughs> response. Um, well, we do have the opposite as well when the, <laughs> the outcome is not so good, unfortunately, and that is a very sad situation. Um, and in that situation, it's very important to like Dr. Basmanji said, put yourself in the patient's situation and if you were there, how would you feel? And to be there to help them on not just the physical level of medicine but the emotional level of dealing with it as well. One last question. Anyone have a question? Yes. What are the expectations in school? So I think it probably depends on the program that you're in for the specific expectations, but I think what helps the most in any education is really wanting to learn. I think that's probably 75% of it, that's what makes it difficult, is if you're enjoying what you're doing, it makes it a lot easier, and I think that was what was said before, and I completely agree. So if you're somebody who loves to learn, you'll probably do very well, and if you're not, find something you do care about. I think that's what is most important. And then I'm sure each program has its own in terms of GPA and grades. Just, just do your best. It's really the best advice. Yeah. Yes, I think that instead of, uh, I mean, those are practical questions as to what is expected uh, from, you know, from the schools. But you have to really ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I doing this to get into a school? Or am I, getting, am I doing this to really do what I really have a passion for? And each of you, I think, especially the young ones, you have to keep answer, answering this question. You know, are you hungry? Are you hungry and what are you hungry for? Okay? Chicken nuggets? <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> but if you're not hungry, 
it's going to be more difficult for you to do what is expected of you. always easy and they weren't hungry and then 20 years from now because if I give you an iPhone that's for free and I give you one that works hard for you always hard for you to clean toilets which one would you value more the one that you worked hard for one thing that we're doing because of fear we're keeping kids at home and giving them everything that they want without them working for it they achieve success that brother at the end did crazy amount of work all of them <laughs> Because they were at a point where they had no other option. They wanted to work so hard. Right now, we're giving too many options to give things for free without hard work. It's almost as if your kids are lifting weights. You're stopping them and lifting weights for them. Give them their problems back. Give them the weight back. And this is what you will achieve. Please, I beg you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so with that, we will wrap up this panel on careers in healthcare and move on to the next panel. But I do want to remind you that uh, they are all eager to answer your questions. So please visit their booth at the back for careers in healthcare. And uh, let's uh, say a loud salawat for them as we welcome up our next panel for careers in uh, finance law. We have candy. Come to us. <laughs> One more loud salawat as everyone gets settled. <laughs> so this panel is for careers in finance and the law. Again, I'll start out with the same question as the last panel. Um, I'd like all of you to tell me about your current position very briefly and just a brief summary of how you got to where you are. And then we'll move on. And um, audience members, while you're sitting there, you can think of questions that you can ask them. Okay? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So I'm Rosina. I am an audit director at MetLife, uh, which is an insurance company based here in New York. So I'm from uh, Toronto originally. So I went to University of Toronto. I did my undergrad. Um, and the nice thing, I majored in accounting. Um, but the nice thing about my program was you had three internships that you had to complete. So by the time I graduated, I already had a year's worth of work experience under my, my belt, which was really great. Um, so all three of my internships, I worked at Deloitte in their enterprise risk services practice, which I think they've renamed something else now. Um, but I did IT auditing. So, you know, I, I worked there. Alhamdulillah, they liked me enough. They hired me full time to start after I graduated. Um, so I started working there. I decided to do my CPA um, and my CA, which is the Canadian equivalent of your CPA. Um, and then I moved here to New York in 2008, which was like the worst time in the recession to move. So <laughs> that was fun. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I moved here. I started working at MetLife, um, and I've been there for over 10 years now. I started off doing IT audit work. Um, I moved over. I got opportunities to lead audits in India. I went to our Dublin office for um, a good six months, and I got a chance to lead our um, IT audit team for Europe, Middle East, Africa, which was really great. Um, and then I came back here to uh, New York, and now I lead business audits. Um, so yeah, a little bit of everything. Yes, sure. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, my name is Muhammad Hassan Alu. I am a manager of medical economics and what that, that's just a fancy word for um, uh, running or monitoring the finances associated with a hospital or a physician group. So it's very much uh, finances related with healthcare. Um, how I got there was, uh, and maybe an example of that is say, hey, Dr. Sali Muhammad, is doing cert a certain things a certain way, and Dr. Ali Alu is treating his patients a certain way, but when he's treating his patients, it costs $1,000, but when Dr. Salih Muhammad is treating his patients, it costs $5,000,
and that's where I would come in and say, why? <laughs> okay, so that, that's just a sort of small snapshot of what uh, I do on a daily basis. Uh, how I got here is uh, a series of um, discoveries, uh, failures, and a lack of visualization of where I'm going. So if you ask me when I was in college, um, can you visualize what you're going to do? Um, no, it was zero, it was blank, there was nothing I was visualizing. Um, I liked math. Um, I liked coding, so I did uh, some computer engineering, I did some electrical engineering, I loved math, so I did some math, I got a degree in applied math and statistics, um, and yeah, and then I got into contracting with uh, Guardian Life Insurance, I did a lot of actuarial work there, I took some actuarial exams, um, it was very healthcare focused, even though it was a life insurance company, they had a healthcare division, so I focused a lot on that, and that's sort of how I ended up in the role I am in uh, today. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ali. I am general counsel for a media digital music streaming service. We're one of India's largest streaming services. Uh, my role is uh, pretty diverse. I do a lot of different things. So I do everything from licensing stuff like podcasts and video to working with our engineering team on like rollouts of new products. I work on cybersecurity, data privacy. So when we're an app, we collect nine trillion different data points on all of you. I know everything about you all, by the way. <laughs> and I know especially your behavioral patterns. <laughs> what you like in the morning, what you like in the evening. And, but there are rules and regulations about how that's used, how that's transferred. And I make sure that we operate within those rules, those guardrails. I got here through the most long-winded and strangest way. I was prepared. I wanted to be a doctor when I was in high school. I went to UVA and I promptly failed out of organic chem lab and decided that I would be a religious studies major. And I took all my dad's classes, which I thought I'd get A's in, and I didn't because he was really hard on me. <laughs> and then I, um, I didn't know what to do. I had a degree in religion and Middle Eastern studies, and I was qualified to be a waiter, and or go to grad school. So I decided to go to law school. And I went to law school. I took the LSATs. I went to law school. I went to the University of Richmond, and I did miserably because I had never lived on my own, and I would never had any sense of discipline whatsoever. So I graduated near part of my class, and I gr worked at a bagel shop called the Lazy Bagel in downtown Richmond. And my buddy walked in and was like, yo, you want to work for my boss? He's looking for a new lawyer. Uh, and I'm like, what kind of law? Criminal. I'd never even taken a criminal law course other than the basic one. And I was like, yeah, sure, yeah, I'll do it. It's better than working in a bagel shop. And uh, he said, and the interview was basically like, do you speak English? And I said, yes. And I got the job. And that was it. And I worked as a criminal defense lawyer for four years, and I was really good at it. I defended murders. Well, you name the crime, I defended them. And then I moved to New York, and I, oh, my boss went to jail. That's why I quit my job. That's, so one, so then I moved to New York. Oh, by the way, before, uh, to take, so to become a lawyer, I have to take a bar exam, right? If the bar exam is a really tough exam. I failed it three times. I passed it the fourth. And then I came to New York, I took the bar exam and passed it the first time. So I, failure, failure, job, like boss disappears, he's in jail, I lose my job, I move to New York, I start over, I live, that's why I came to this mosque for the first time, I lived on people's couches, there are a lot of khalfans here, I owe big, a <laughs> khalfan out there, wherever you are. Anyway, so, and then I, transition to, and then eventually I was really lucky I got married for some odd reason because I, I got a job on Wall Street. So she was like, oh, I'm marrying a Wall Street lawyer. Great. And then, and then when I moved, and then, uh, and then I decided to switch jobs again. And I wanted to follow my passion, which uh, I'm going to say it anyway, uh, oh is music. I know, so bad. <laughs> we just finished my dress class. Right, anyway, so yeah, I pursued a career in music law. I worked for myself because I couldn't get a job. And then eventually, in 2017, this technology company came to me and said, would you be our general counsel? And I was like, I don't even know what that means. And I was like, what do you want? And I was like, I don't know, back up to 75 grand, I'm in. And I literally took the job and I, it's been unbelievable. This is the blessing that 
my family's support and sacrifice was like they s I was on my own I built my career I'm not the smartest kid on the block but I worked hard worked hard and really passionate and the work I do right now is the work I really want to do for the rest of my life and that's the summary of my journey wow <laughs> a loud salawat for all of those intro stories wow So now, and again, um, all of you don't have to answer, but what is a stereotype that you have heard about your role or your field, and uh, what would be your response? Does the reality fit within that stereotype or not? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I know. I, I don't know how I topped kind of those answers, but um, in terms of stereotypes, so you think accounting, you think boring, and you have to be a math nerd to be really good at it. So. Um, a, accounting is not boring. I think, you know, we, <laughs> we, ha we have a funny sense of humor, I guess. I don't know, and we love Excel, but um, it's actually really interesting. Um, so that's kind of the first piece of it. Um, and then the other piece is, is being a math nerd. I mean, I'll tell you the reason why I went into accounting is I love math. You know, going through, uh, through high school, university, I loved all that complex calculus. Like, I loved it. I was all about it. And that's what I thought accounting was about. Because really, in high school, you don't know too much about what you're getting yourself into once you kind of signed up to do a degree in accounting. Um, but really, I think what's surprising, uh, and if, you know, not being good at math is holding you back from pursuing a career in accounting, you really just need kind of the basic fundamental knowledge of, you know, of math. You really don't need some of those complex, uh, you know, understanding complex calculus or anything like that. So don't let that hold you back. How many of you like math? Oh, good. Okay, a lot of future accountants. <laughs> Any of you uh, would like to respond about the stereotype? Yeah? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure what the stereotypes for my job would be. Uh, but again, uh, math. Uh, you got to love math. Uh, problem solving. This is the typical things that um, sort of that industry is looking for. It's, it's heavy analytics. means analyzing something and understanding what's driving it upwards, downwards, and how you can make or impact change, how you can effectuate change, uh, that sort of uh, everyday sort of thing that we're looking for. And that is sort of a stereotype for those kind of roles. Any analytic roles, I think like you've got uh, Brother Ali Ladakh, he's doing a lot of analytics. Data visualization means taking all these millions and millions of rows of data points and sort of telling a story with it. Um, that's sort of the st stereotypes of the job and that's essentially what you would need to do. Okay, so an inquisitive nature. I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question for this panel for careers in uh, finance and law? Yes. So this is like a question about law, basically, mostly. Like, if you're like defending like a criminal, can you go to jail for trying to defend him? No. Unless, of course, you also commit a crime. <laughs> <laughs> so we, when I know, the, I know exactly what you're thinking about. How could I defend? How, first of all, the question I always get is, were all your clients innocent or guilty? No, they were all guilty. I assure you, 99.9% .9 of them were guilty of something. But then, then the question number two is, well, how could you defend them if you know they're guilty? Because our Constitution affords the opportunity for people to the, the right to defend themselves. And uh, my job is to give them the tools to present the argument that allows, I mean, I'm very, very simplistic. I'm putting it in a really simple way, which is one of the stereotypes that people think that lawyers are, you know, what's the, what's the best lawyer joke that I can think of? You know, how do you know a lawyer is lying? He's moving his lips. You know, because they're always, like, we're always doing something crazy. Like, we're always trying to make up, mitigate. And so it's, there's, and, but, you know, it's, we did it all the time. It was my job. It was, it was sometimes it was really hard, I admit. I, I didn't sleep that well at night sometimes, knowing that I was a really good criminal defense lawyer and I got my client off, even though I knew he was guilty. It, in Islam, that's a great question. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a question I've been battling, apparently, throughout my career. <laughs> professional career. Is that allowed in Islam? Um, yeah. No, <laughs> kind of. I don't know. 
We'll have to ask someone more qualified. <laughs> Very uh, entertaining responses on this panel. <laughs> Any other questions for this panel before we have to scoot them all off out of here? <laughs> Any other questions, even the adults, if you have a question for them? I tell you, I was just wondering that since you have gone through all this struggle and all the learning process while you were becoming a lawyer, why would you not spend some time and teach some of the kids here or spend your time, part time or whatever time it is, to inspire other guys to small young fellows like 10, 15 year old people or 20 year old guys to start to teach them the law? and what you went through. Maybe that will inspire I would, them. I would, to love to. I, I would love to. First of all, uh, I slept on his couch <laughs> when I moved here for I months. <laughs> he was incredibly kind. He opened his doors and just put like, like sleep there. Literally six months, I just crashed on his bed. Um, I, a couple things. One, um, I, I would obviously love to mentor and help anyone in this journey because we the ability to jump out of failure, you know, we've all, it's to deal with failure effectively is, is a key set. But another two issue, quite frankly, was credibility. I didn't want to, you know, my, client, my line of work is not exactly one that, you know, befits uh, a religious sort of community necessarily because music, etc., blah, blah, blah. But that being said, from a, as a lawyer, yeah, I'm happy to, I would love to. It's, I love, love, passionately what I do. As a lawyer, a technology lawyer, I do human resource issues data privacy, I, every spectrum of the, I do tax, regulatory compliances, everything. Like that's, that's my current and I, every day I feel like an imposter. I suffer from imposter syndrome, but I learn and learn and learn. And I'd love to, anytime, I, please come hit me up, anytime. <laughs> Is there any last question from the audience before we move on to the next panel? Last question. Okay, so save those questions and you can ask them all at their booths. Let's give them a loud salawat, a uh, panel on careers in finance and the law. Loud salawat for them. Thank you so much. <laughs> Our next panel is for careers in business and engineering. So the panel for careers in business and engineering, you can make your way up. Back here, you're on the panel. <laughs> As we begin the panel on careers in business and engineering. Oh, that was not loud at all. One more time, please. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alim. I'll open this panel with the same question that the last panel has got. Please tell us your current position and how you got to where you are right now. So we can start over there. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ali Amurji, and um, I'm actually from Toronto originally as well, like a few of the other colleagues in the room that were also on the panel. So I went to York University, I did an honors degree in human resources management and then I did an education degree. My passion was always to become a teacher but I also had a keen interest in business so I decided to find a field that would marry the two areas very well um, and that led me to my career in learning and organizational development which is a branch off of HR. 
Um, so when I was in Toronto, I worked at a hospital and I was an HR learning and OD consultant. Um, and then I came here and now I'm at Northwell Health also as a learning and OD specialist. So we do things um, like training and development programs, leadership development, um, onboarding and orientation. We do a lot of technology work with building courses. Really, we're focused on developing leaders and uh, increasing the potential of our employees in an organization alongside with the rest of the HR functions. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Shamim Rashid Sumar. I'm a fire protection engineer. I'm originally from Maryland, so I went to the University of Maryland, which has one of a very few uh, Bachelor of Science in Engineering programs in fire protection engineering. And I'm going to disagree with Brother Hussein. That degree was very hard. <laughs> I struggled, um, but I made it. I finished in four years. Didn't do too, too bad. Um, and then I went to work in the Washington, D.C. area as um, an entry-level fire protection associate consultant. And I worked in Washington, D.C. on different types of building projects, um, townhomes, um, all different types of buildings, some commercial buildings. I did that for about four or five years. And then I got an opportunity that popped up. Um, I actually got an email that was sent to everyone in my company. And I printed it out. Um, it was for um, moving overseas and to work in the Middle East. So originally, I printed this out as a joke. Uh, because my husband was always like, we should move to Dubai, we should move to Dubai. And I said, I don't really know where Dubai is. What are you talking about? Um, and then this email comes a few years later. So I thought this was hilarious. I printed it out as a joke, and I took it home. And my husband said, who sent you this email? I said, oh, this, this man sent it from our Chicago office. He said, go tomorrow and tell him you want to do this. I said, are you crazy? Like, he's going to be like, who the heck are you? Why should we send you to Dubai? He said, they're not going to say that. They know who you are. They know you work hard. And you are perfect for this job. So I took a big risk. I actually, the other problem was um, we were both career people. And, and I have just started a career. And he has just started a career. So I said, what about you? He said, you go. And I'll come when I can. So um, in 2007, I took a small baby and went to Dubai for myse by myself with my mother-in-law. <laughs> Um, and my husband came a couple of years later, but that was really the best decision I made. Um, the engineering you know, scene in, in Dubai gave me a lot of great experience that I couldn't have gotten in Washington, D.C. So we stayed in Dubai for 12 years. I ended up um, managing our operations in Dubai. Then I moved to business development, so I was responsible for selling engineering services for my company all over the Middle East, uh, including areas such as Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Um, that was a very grueling lifestyle. It meant I was on the road for um, weeks. I was away from, from my kids. Um, so I decided that um, maybe it was time to slow down, um, come back home. So my family and I have moved back to the United States this past summer. And I now work in an advocacy role for the concrete industry. And I uh, advocate for fire-resistant, fire-safe construction, and I work in the codes and standards world to make our codes more, uh, more resilient. Notice you took a big risk. Was she was comfortable with being uncomfortable. As soon as we become uncomfortable, we quit. She did it. What was she was able to achieve? Amazing. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Barker. I work in a cool industry, so <laughs> sorry, none of that. <laughs> I work in marketing, um, for which sometimes you need a degree, sometimes you don't. Um, if you don't have one, don't worry about it. You can still, you can still, uh, you know, get into marketing. Um, I was, uh, um, I was born in Pakistan and lived there for a few years. Somehow ended up in Kenya, lived there for a few years. Somehow ended up in London, lived there for a lot of years, and now I've somehow ended up over here. And. Uh, it's been a great journey, I'm not going to lie. Um, but I wasn't in marketing all the time. I, I actually studied HR um, for, as a degree, two of them, um, both masters. But, um, and I worked. I worked for six months. So my family background is everyone's in banking. So I had to go do banking. In the first six months, banking and HR, I wanted to shoot myself. It's like, I can't do this for a living. 
good salary, everything was great, but I could not do this for a living. I knew that at some point I'm going to get really depressed. And Brother Char said, very good thing. If, it's not, if, if you don't want to wake up in the morning to go to work, or if it doesn't excite you, don't do it. Unless you have so many people to feed, which is a lot of people, right? Which is 80% of the crowd. The reason why they work in dead-end jobs or whatever they don't like is because they cannot take that risk. Alhamdulillah, I didn't have that issue. So what I did, six months later, I actually left that job. And I went, and I went back to my roots. I did a, I did a marketing degree at a, at a bachelor's level. And I went back to my roots, and I actually joined a company. And one of the first projects I worked on was to hand out free Mars bars at King's Cross Station with Metro newspaper. Both were free. And I was handing it out while somebody, one woman, was looking at me from a very far constantly. And I was quite, I was, I was nervous about that. I, I could see that there was a woman actually there for half an hour looking at me. So later on I went up to her with a Mars bar and the newspaper and I was like, can I help you? Like, this is, this is for you. I know that, you know, you didn't want to come. And she's like, do you know who, who I am? And I'm like, no, do you know which company you work for? Yes, I'm the managing director of that company. And I'm like, okay, uh, sure. And she's like, I know all about you. And I'm like, okay, that's really good. And she's like, why don't you come and see me at three o'clock in my, in my office? And I was wearing what I'm wearing right now, all black. And I was like, um, I don't know where this is going, but I'm not wearing a suit and tie. I can't go home. I've got to go to another job doing exactly what I'm doing right now. And she's like, no, don't worry about it. Just come. I went there, and the place, 3, three o'clock I got there, the place was in a mess. I'm not kidding. 25 people literally running into each other. So I was like, okay, what's happening here? She looked at me, and she's like, we don't have time to sit. Let's go. Are you okay to go back to the city? I'll, I'll, I'll give you a ride. And I'm like, uh, sure. So we sat in the car, and she's like, do you know where we're going? And I'm like, I have absolutely no idea. I have no idea what I'm doing here to begin with. And, uh, and then she's like, um, I'm going to offer you a job. We're actually going somewhere, and you're going to be the project manager of 500 people. And I'm like, sorry, you've probably got this wrong. You have no idea who I am. And she's like, I know exactly who you are. It is because of the way you work, the concentration, the focus that you have. I know that you're going to be good at this. I can see it. I'm like, okay, let's do that. And she stopped by somewhere. And I'm like, um, aren't we going quickly? And she's like, oh, no, you have to change. And I'm like, I don't live anywhere close to this. And she's like, no, no don't worry about it. She stopped at the Canali store where she got me a suit, a tie, shoes, everything, at that point. And she's like, change into this, and we're going to go there. And we went somewhere, there were 750 people over there, and I had absolutely no idea. I, I did not know what a budget looked like at that point, and I told her that. And she's like, I will help you with everything. All I need is man management skills, and you have that. That was my career into what I do now. I do project management of big experiential events. We create massive live events everywhere around the globe. And in the United States, I now own an agency and work with the same sort of clients who do major events. And that's what I do. Wow. Sorry, it took no, no, a long while. Thank you for that interesting story. You notice the unexpected came. And then I tell you unexpected things come. What do you have to do? Hard work. See, some of you are sitting and I'm paying attention. Saying, do you have the hard work? You've been sitting for a while to stay in this room, to stay present. Where somebody looks at you and says, oh, this person was here the whole time present. One person did that to him within an hour, within an hour, gave him an opportunity that was unexpected. That's Allah's breadcrumbs. He leaves you within the universe. He says, here you go. You've worked hard. Pay attention. The unexpected is coming. That's why start off your day with success. How you do anything is how you do everything. Even the way you're paying attention now, even adults, it resonates to things like this. I've seen it too many times for it to be a coincidence. So let's, well, let's thank him with a large salawat. Thanks.
Next question um, for any of you can answer. Do you have a mentor? And if so, how does that help you? Um, in, uh, how has that helped you in your career progression? Sorry, it's me again. Um, <laughs> you get tired. Um, so, I um, I've always had this this person who um, who has been a mentor, or more than that, somebody who is still back in Kenya, um, still back in Kenya, and he was one of the very first jobs that I actually did. I I went in um, and I sold um, ceramic tiles, and after work, he and I would sit down and talk about, talk about quite a few things. And he loved the sort of ideas that I had, but he didn't have anybody to sort of uh, implement those ideas. And he and I would sort of sit down and he'd tell me his life story. And what was really amazing was how he came about. What did he do to come to where he was? He became, he was an entrepreneur. He became huge. Um, and what I learned from him was how to sort of never give up, perseverance is the biggest thing I learned from this mentor and I can never ever ever thank him enough. How many of you in the audience have a mentor? Yep, just a few hands. Well, how many of you are going to go around to these booths and find a mentor after this is over? Yes, thank you Ali Reza. Um, okay, so I will open it up to the floor for questions. Who has a question for any of the individuals on this panel? Anyone with a question for the individuals on the panel? Yeah, did you have a question? No? Okay. Any of the adults have a question? Hmm? <laughs> You have a question? Yes. Oh, I think you can come up with one. I'm going to come over here anyways. She does? Do you have a question? No. Are you sure? You can ask them anything. Any of you. Someone give me a question. <laughs> no, I don't have one. I don't have one. You have one? What's one advice you... What's one advice you would give to your past self? That if you could go back five years or ten years, what one advice you would tell that person? I think if I could talk to my old self, uh, younger self, I would say believe in yourself. There are so many times when I struggled because I felt like, almost like the, our friend, the lawyer that has the imposter syndrome, that I'm not good enough as everybody else, um, especially being a, a woman in a male-dominated field. Um, believe in myself and, and don't let um, small things get under your skin. So on a similar line to that, I would say to just remember that you can do it. So whether you are young, whether you are later in your career and you decide to switch fields, um, you know, a female, male, whatever it is, um, that it is possible and that women can break the glass ceiling in the corporate world. It is possible to excel and um, to have the same opportunities that the, male, um, the males have, whether it's in finance, accounting, HR, whatever field, if it's healthcare, um, that there is equal opportunity and that um, women are able to break barriers today. Last chance for a question to this panel before we move on to our final panel. Yes? What's like the your greatest accomplishment in your field? In my field, I think um, the greatest compliment I have is I ran a London's 2012 Olympics project um, with 70 days on the on the road, a multi-million dollar project by by myself. Uh, of course, I had a lot of help, um, no doubt about that. But uh, I think career-wise, that's possible. 
I did not, I, I really, when, when we got on it, two years of planning, I did not see it being possible. When, 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 actually did, when it actually did happen, the, the smiles on people's faces. You know, when, when something like a big sporting event happened, something like that, and a lot of people sort of gather, hundreds of thousands of people gather, you, you, you move away from there and, and you go away and you, you look at a bigger picture and you see, what are these people thinking right now? They're having a great time. They're having a time of their lives. The athletes. And that all became true because we worked together. So I think that is, career-wise, I think that was the highlight of my career and hopefully that happens again at some point. <laughs> Um, the, the biggest accomplishment, I think, is um, being named a, a fellow of the Society of Fire Protection Engineers. And um, basically, as an engineer, uh, you can be licensed as a, as a professional. And then uh, there's um, engineering societies for all disciplines. But in the discipline that I work in, in fire protection, um, if you become a licensed engineer and you are practicing for at least 10 years, uh, you're eligible for your peers to nominate you as a fellow. And that, that um, title, fellow, is reserved for only 10% of all the engineers in, in my profession. And I was very lucky um, in October, this past October, to be nominated by five people to be considered a fellow in, in my profession. And, and that, to me, meant um, despite all of, of the adversity and, and being different and also being a female, I was still recognized as an expert in my field. I think on a daily basis, um, the feeling of being able to empower individuals is very rewarding to me, and I think that's what's made me want to stay in this field and to feel um, motivated every day to wake up. So whether it's empowering somebody through education, so um, training people, providing su uh, supplementary education, if it's you know mediation, if a manager and an employee is having an issue or somebody feels like it's the end of their career, they're bored in the field, um, giving them the right skills on a daily basis and the guidance that we do in the human resource versus field um, is something that I think rewards me every single day. Thank you very much. So um, we will send them on their way. Again, if you have follow-up questions, you can reach out to them at their booths. And we will invite the final panel up here uh, before we are free to browse the booths. So thank you. A loud salawat for them. Our final uh, panel is uh, on careers in media, education, and technology, so I'll invite them all up. So this is their last chance uh, to listen to a panel and to ask questions. So while they're speaking, think about the questions you'd like to ask them. Okay, so we'll begin this panel with the same question as the others. Just state your current position and a brief summary of how you got to where you are. So we can start over there. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everybody. Uh, my name is Zara, and I am currently a high school science special education teacher. So I teach ninth grade earth science, and I teach 10th grade biology. Um, I live in New York. I've lived in New York all my life. So I went to Malloy College. I was in a five-year program. It was an accelerated program where I graduated with my bachelor's and my master's at the same time. Um, I always knew I wanted to be an educator, but by the time it came to applying to colleges, I kind of wrestled with, do I want to go into the healthcare field or do I want to do education? And part of it was because I wanted the certainty, you know, do I want to be a nurse? Do I want to do those hours? Do I want to have a job security, have that money, and I decided that education was a field that I was going to go into. And part of the reason I did that was because I took every opportunity that was presented to me in education. So I volunteered at the library, I helped at school, um, I helped at the madrasa. I tried to do as much as I could to make sure that that was what I wanted to do. And also when I was in college and opportunities presented themselves, I made sure to take them to make sure that I was in the right field. Salams, my name is Manaz. Um, I do a couple things currently. Right now I'm working at NBC Universal at 30 Rock, so that's where the big Christmas tree is. It's the best and worst place to work. <laughs> um, I'm working there within the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, so it's a bit more of an HR function. 
but in my role, you know, I work with carrying out a variety of initiatives, whether that be targeted towards employees on an internal front or looking towards external branding and positioning our company as one of the top uh, media companies that foster diversity. I'm also, um, with my background, I have studied journalism in my undergrad, so I've been able to use that to help my family spearhead um, a mobile app that's launching next week. Um, and I'm also currently in grad school at the same time, so I'm pursuing my MBA in HR management at Pace University in Ma um, downtown Manhattan. And to be honest, it took me a while to figure out what I wanted to do. You know, I was applying to colleges, and one thing for sure I knew, I couldn't go into healthcare because I can't stand the sight of medicine or anything related to that realm. And so it came down to my mother asking me a question, you know, what do you see yourself doing? Do you see yourself wearing a lab coat, or do you see yourself, you know, in a boardroom in front of a conference and presenting in a pair of heels? And so I chose the latter option. And so I'm only beginning my career. I'm still in school, inshallah, by December. I'll hope hopefully have a job and have a bit more clarity about my focus. But one of the things I would encourage everyone in this room, regardless of age, is that you don't have to know exactly where you're going. You know, life will come at you, things, opportunities will come, and you kind of take it in stride. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Ali Ladik. Uh, I'm currently at Facebook, where I'm a marketing science partner over there. Um, my day-to-day -day is very random, I guess, um, but basically I'm just trying to prove out that Facebook works. So <laughs> I hope you continuously click the like button. Mm. Um, oh unlike what Brother Hussein said, don't click it on it for the pictures that um, have people's feet <laughs> or things like that. But <laughs> click on it for everything else, please. It keeps me employed. Um, <laughs> other than uh, to get there, um, I, had a, I had a long road as well, a winding road, I guess. Um, I started in management when I went to for my undergrad degree in college. Um, got a job in contract litigation and sourcing from there at Ernst & Young realized that I didn't like it. Um, people were making up reasons and on for the decisions they wanted to make for how we would go forward with the plan. And I always wanted to go back to the numbers and prove that the numbers showed this was right or that was wrong. And I realized I liked math then. I had a C average in math before that in undergrad and then figured it out while working that I was more into it than I thought. Went back for my master's in economics, uh, got into finance, equity research, found out that I hate that version of math. Um, it was boring to me. I didn't like the people I was around. So I left that as well um, after I had a random conversation on a train with somebody about marketing analytics. Uh, I looked into it and I really got into it. Um, so I just found something that I thought was fun as my third career within the first five years of my, you know, my background. So just because you haven't figured it out early on doesn't mean you can't figure it out later on. Um, and my, advice, my piece of advice for that is not just that, but also when you're in college or you're taking classes and you can choose what you want to take, don't take just one path. Don't take just a degree in engineering or a degree in management or a degree in HR. Take a class in sociology. Take a class in psychology. Take a class in, 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 in medicine or something different just so you get a full breadth of what's out there and therefore you can make a better decision on what you want to do later on when those times come. Thank you. Um, what makes you happy to go to work every day? Every day is different in my field. I know it's education, but you know I really enjoy working with the kids. I deal with older kids, and so ninth and tenth grade. Some of you are at that age or about to enter that age, and every day is a little different. And I enjoy hearing about their lives. So they'll come in and they'll tell me like, "You'll never believe what happened." And even though it's going to take away from the lesson, you know, we have to learn about genetics and whatever my lesson objective was, I'll take those five minutes to actually get to know them because sometimes those five minutes that they spend with me talking about whatever it is, um, that's the only attention that they get in the day. So I like being that person for somebody that they get to come in and they get excited to tell me something, even if it's the most random piece of information. I go in every morning and I'm like, okay, what's the new information I'm going to learn today? I know I teach my kids something, but every day they teach me something as well, and that's why I wake up and go to work every day, because they are also teaching me something. For me, it's more so being in the media and entertainment industry, you know. When I entered this field, I got a lot of questions from people within our own community, like, what does this mean? Are you going to be on air? And so with my journalism background, it was more so I want to be part of the conversation. We all know how controversial the media can be, you know, the news channels on and off. And so being able to be part of the conversation that can shape perceptions of our own community, I think that's very valuable, and nobody, you know, 
I walk around the halls at work, and I don't see many people who look like me. In fact, I might maybe only know one other person who wears hijab. After that, there's no one. So again, it's like tapping into industries where we haven't been in and making an impression. So being able to be part of that mission, I think that's fantastic. So what's fun for me is that uh, the problems I usually have to solve don't have an answer yet. Um, analytics means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, sometimes it's just creating trends and looking at the data and figuring out if there's trends or there's a, there's a, there's a point where something has an emphasis. And then sometimes it's trying to figure out a whole new solution of something that you haven't thought about. So I get to sit down and just brainstorm and figure out new ways to solve problems about why you hit the like button versus why you hit the heart button versus why you gave the thumbs down button. So it's just fun to brainstorm and think of new solutions to problems we've never thought of before. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience for this panel? It's our last panel. Your last chance to ask them a question while they're up here before you, they go to the booths. Anyone have a question for them? Yes. What app or like is, are you releasing? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, so my family is actually releasing an app next week. It's called Sahifa. And so it's actually a collection of duas, amals, and prayers. And so what's so fantastic about me being able to work on this project is that I've been able to use my background and flex the different muscles I've gained. Because so much of your career is about the transferable skills. You know, you can be in a finance accounting one day and next thing you know you land in HR. But it's not so much, you know, the mathematical skills and analytics that you're taking with you, but it's the transferable things that you can bring with you. So this is just one example of how your career can be one way, but you can also have passions and hobbies on the side. And that's something that I encourage for all of you to discover. Did you say that you are looking for people to assist with yes, that effort? Yes, we are actually offering internships, editorial internships to help with writing as well as social media to help um, our social media campaigns. So if anyone's interested, you can come contact me after the panel. Uh, what sort of age range would that be for? Um, ideally, we're looking for 16 and above, only because we're looking for people who can articulate, especially looking at Islamic history. So I'd be happy to go into more detail later, but definitely approach me. We have lots of opportunities to get involved, so keep that in mind. Okay, any other questions from the floor? Any other questions from the floor, even from the adults? No one? Okay, so then that's fine. Um, thank you very much for uh, all of your insight and your wisdom. I'm sure that they will come and hit you up at the booths. Um, you can go and take a seat. And before we close off the uh, panels, um, I wanted to take a moment to thank all of the individuals who donated towards this program and made it possible for us to invite all of these individuals who have come to assist you today. I also wanted to take a moment um, to thank the family of Haider Lada Dinani who have donated the uh, pizza for all the children to eat today. Can we take a moment to recite a Surah Fatiha, please? Al Fatiha. So before we close off the um, panel portion, I just wanted to remind all of the children, we have the career passports available for you at the registration desk where Sister Ruhaina is. So you can go and get the career passports and take those around to the booths with you. When the booth individuals sign for you after you've asked them some questions, you can go and redeem it for a prize at the back table. And again, we also have the contact sheets available there um, for those who want the follow-up information for everyone. Thank you for um, listening so patiently. And a reminder, if you'd like your photo taken for uh, a LinkedIn profile picture, then please head over to the Coastal Photography booth um, over on the left-hand side here.